Well, this morning we are going to get straight into the Word of God. And the message is called the Word of God. And it's not just because I'm uncreative and couldn't be bothered thinking of anything different. It just pretty much sums up what I'm wanting to speak about more than anything else. Now, today I'm giving you the heads up. I'm going to make you work for it. No PowerPoints. All the Scriptures, believe it or not, are not contained on the PowerPoint, but are contained in your Bibles or on your smartphones. Who here has got your Bible app on your phone? Who here has got your Bible with you, your hard copy Bible? Who likes the, rough, the rustling of the pages? Very good. It doesn't matter. The content is exactly the same. Who here has memorized the whole Bible and can just do it by memory? Joy, I'm very impressed. We're going to test you with that today. Um, so uh, if you don't have the Bible on your phone, a couple of things that you can do. I would encourage you to download a version called YouVersion. Uh, it's one of the most popular apps, not just Bible apps, most popular apps um, of all time, over 100 uh, million downloads, and so you can be part of that 100 million, uh, and that means that you've got the Bible accessible wherever you go, including right now, here in this moment. All right, Joy, can you tell me what Acts 2.42 says? Jesus did not weep in Acts 2.42. You're going to need to download that app right now. <laughs> Good effort, though. Good effort. All right, let's pray and we'll get into it. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Your word does not return to, your, uh, return to you void. We thank you that your word is alive. It is living and active, and it is useful in our lives right here, right now, today. We pray that the condition, the soil of our heart would be ripe, would be ready to receive what you're about to put into us. Father, we are here to get around your word, not the words of uh, a pastor or a preacher, but the word of God. Speak to us, challenge us, cut us to the core. And uh, Father, we pray that we would leave here different than when we walked in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Fantastic. Well, who was here last week when Pastor Joel was preaching about repentance? For those that weren't, can I strongly encourage you uh, to get onto YouTube and download that message. It's a really powerful one, and it also sets the tone for the next few weeks. You see, we're in a series called the Grassroots Series. We're going back to basics. Now, the good thing about going back to the basics uh, is for, I guess, for two groups of people. For those that are new to the faith, it's a great way to get the foundational things, the things that God most wants to instill in your life down pat to help you get established in your, uh, in your life, in your journey following Jesus. But for those of us who have been serving Jesus for quite some time, uh, I love, and I'm 14 and a half years old as a Christian, which for me is quite old, um, over half my life. And for me, I love getting around these type of messages because it takes the complex, it takes all the distractions out, and it reminds me what uh, I'm supposed to really be about. What is it that I should be devoted to? What are the things that are, uh, are not relevant for me right now? What are the things that God wants me to focus on? So regardless of where you are this morning, Listen for what God is wanting to speak to you. All right, so we are looking at the book of Acts at the moment. The theme that we're looking at is from Acts 2.42, just to give you the heads up. But before we get to Acts 2.42, we've got to understand what has been going on. Now, for roughly two months, uh, that would be the equivalent of middle of June to the 10th of August that we are in right now, in that two-month period, just think about what you've been through, what's happened in your life. Perhaps uh, by, you know, uh, Joel and Leandi who've given birth in that time, there may not have been that much drama in that period of time. Uh, you might have had a few paychecks. You might have um, ha had a few, I don't know, we've moved house in that time. But nothing, I bet, has happened in that time that is as dramatic as what happened for the disciples and the apostles. You see, in a two-month period, Jesus told his 12 mates that he was going to die. Jesus actually died, then he rose again, then he appeared to hundreds of people over a 40-day period, then Jesus met with the disciples that he had left, 
And he spoke to them and he promised them a gift. And if they would just be patient and wait, then power would come to them and they would be witnesses. They met together and they prayed. And uh, until that gift clearly came, the day of Pentecost hit and the room was filled with a sound like rushing wind. Tongues of fire, what seemed to be tongues of fire, rested upon them and they started to speak in a whole new language. Who wishes they could speak in a new language in a two-month period? Uh, Something incredible happened. Then Peter preached an incredible message. 3,000 people got saved in one service. Their church grew 2,600% in one go. And Jesus, uh, and Peter rather, laid the foundation that to be saved, we must be, we must first repent. And then after we've repented, to be water baptized, to declare that Jesus is Lord, and then to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all of that is what Pastor Joel covered last week. That's a pretty intense two-month period. But my question is, what happens from there? What happens from there for the disciples? What happens uh, from there for the 3,000 that were added? And what happens when we get to that point that we have repented, we've given our heart, we've raised our hand and said, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of our life. We make a decision that we're going to get water baptized as Jesus personally commanded each and every one of us, not worrying about whether we think that we're good enough or perfect enough, but just receiving that free gift, the grace of God, and, um, and, and when we have access to the Holy Spirit. Well, Acts 2.42 gives us the clue. Who's got it in their Bibles? All right, moment of testing. We're going to read it out together. I know there's about 15 different versions, but, you know, it'll all blend in and my voice will dominate anyway, so we'll be all right. Are you ready to read, church? Oh, where did the energy go from the last song? I can't do it. Uh, Are you ready to read, church? Are you ready to open up the Word of God, the living and active, breathing Word of God that is going to speak to you and challenge you today? Are you ready, church? That's a bit better. All right. Acts 42, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Four things that they were instructed to be devoted to. The first one is this, the Word of God. Second, fellowship. Third, communion or the breaking of bread. And fourth is prayer. Things that they were devoted to, not obligated to, not even just dedicated to, but devoted to. The word devoted to me, it brings up connotations of a love, of a heart. These were things that the apostles cultivated in the hearts of the people. They said, these are the things to fall in love with. Fall in love with the Word of God. Fall in love with the community, with the fellowship of believers. Fall in love with, the, with communion, with understanding what Jesus Christ has done for us, not just in His death, but also in His resurrection. To fall in love with these things, to be devoted to them. So why was the very first thing that they were called or encouraged to be devoted to or to fall in love with the teaching of God's Word. What was it about the Word of God that made it the first and possibly the quintessential ingredient in living as a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, I believe that to answer that question, we need to look at a biblical character that I respect for many reasons, and one of them because he shares the same name as me. We're going to look at Peter, of course. Um, Now, Peter had an up and down journey with the Word of God, remembering that the Word of God is not just the Bible that we hold in our hands or the app that we press on our iPhone. It is the living, breathing Word of God. Every word that Jesus spoke when He was on earth was the Word of God. Now, Peter's journey with the Word of God, like I said, it was a bit of a roller coaster. It had its ups and had its downs. The reason why I chose Peter to look at the Word of God is because more than any other person, he knew how to hit the high notes, but he also knew how to spectacularly fail in responding to the Word of God. And just some examples, when Jesus came to him, a good example, when he passed the test, Jesus came to him as a fisherman and said to 
uh, said to him, Peter, follow me. And Peter responded. He accepted the word of God and he responded. He followed Jesus. Well done, Peter. You got a pass. Then the next moment or later on, uh, Jesus tells him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows in the morning. This very night, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter rejects the word of God, the words of Jesus. And he fails miserably, of course, the rooster crows, and uh, Peter has denied Jesus three times. And then, Jesus, uh, then Peter passes the test again, and he declares that, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus commends him and says, well done, Peter, because this was not revealed to you by man, but this was revelation. This was given to you, a revelation by, the, by God the Father. And then literally a, a, a few moments later, Jesus has to rebuke Peter uh, because he is saying to him that surely you will not die when Jesus starts to prophesy about his death. Peter hits these real high times, these times that Jesus is just amazed. And, 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 uh, and of course, we can look at walking on the water as a great example of that. But he also hits those low times. And I believe it was through these highs and these lows, these trials of responding to the Word of God, that Peter got his foundation, his love, and his devotion for the Word of God. And so we are going to follow his example. All right, four things that you need to know about the Word of God. Why? Why it is important to have a devotion to the Word of God. The first one is that the Word of God is your protection. The Word of God is a solid rock. And so I have an example just to back this up. Nakia, can we have our first prop This was about as big a rock, if you like, as I could find. This is the Word of God. It is, it's actually quite heavy, uh, but (laughs) it's a good chance for me to work out. I'm not really going to the gym, so this is my free way of getting um, a few, little bit more muscle built, not much, but a little bit. But the Word of God is like this. It is rock solid. It is unbreakable. It is unchanging. No matter what happens, it will not break. And of course, the Word of God that, uh, that we're talking about is, of course, even stronger than just a paver. It is something that is like granite. It cannot be shaken. And so we are called as disciples to stand on the Word of God, to let that be our foundation, to be, let that be the thing that holds us into place. And we look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. I am going to give you a moment to get there. Matthew 7, verse 24, which of course Joy could recite for us by memory. It's okay, I'll cover it for you. All right, therefore, how are we going? Are we still turning? So anyway, I, re- I remember being in church and all you would hear when, uh, when we'd come around the Word of God is the rustling of pages and apparently there's even an app that's been made up now that rustles the pages for you. Uh, so if you've got that, by all means use it. This is going to be the best chance you have. But Matthew chapter 7 verse 24, these are the words of Jesus, therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, he is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The foundations of a house are vitally important. It doesn't matter how great the walls are. It doesn't matter how great the roof is. You can have the best interior design. You can have the most awesome air air conditioning. You can have all the bells and whistles, all the features. But what really counts in a time of a storm is making sure that that house has strong foundations. Jesus also talked about a rock at another point in time, as I just mentioned. And it's after Peter declares, Peter gets this revelation from God that Jesus Christ is not just an ordinary man. He's not just a prophet, but he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. He is the Savior, the one that has been promised for thousands of years. 
And Jesus responds to him and he tells him, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. A couple of things about that verse, and then we'll come back to the house built on the rock. Firstly, Jesus is not saying that the church is built on Peter. He says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, what was the rock? The rock was the revelation that Peter had. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Messiah. Centerpoint exists today because Jesus is the one who saves us. Jesus is our Messiah. It is a rock-solid foundation. It cannot be shaken. And you and I collectively make up the church. And individually, we are a part of the church. In other words, collectively, we are called as a church, not just Centerpoint Church, but the church, the bride of Christ across every continent, across all denominations. We are called as the church to have our foundation on the Word of God, on the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Lord. But also, if we break it down to an individual level, I, you, individually, are called to have our life built on the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Every brick of that house, you and I are a brick, every brick is called to have our foundation built on a solid, solid, solid foundation. And there is only one solid foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Now, the thing about sand, as opposed to rock, is this. Sand is basically fragments of rock. Rock that has been broken up. A lot of the time, it has the same material. It's just that it has been eroded away. It has been broken up. It is very similar and yet very different. You see, a rock is solid. It is inflexible. It cannot be moved. It cannot be shaken. Sand is adaptable. Sand is convenient. Sand can, you can kind of pour sand out wherever you want it to go and it will fit however you want it to look. Sand is fragments of revelation that Jesus is the Savior. It is, if you like, uh, a rock is the fullness of the gospel, is the fullness of the Word of God. Sand is fragments, pulling little bits and pieces from it. We live in a world that finds it very tempting to take little bits here and there. And when it comes to the Word of God, it can be very tempting to take the parts that we like from the Word of God, and we build that as our foundation. And we apply that to our lives. God is our provider. Is it true? Absolutely. But if that's all we believe, and there's no lordship, there's no sacrifice, there's no giving, there's no serving, then we are missing the, the point, we are not building our life on a rock, we're building it on a piece, on a fragment of the rock. Pastor David Storer uh, used to preach this a lot, and it really has become ingrained in me. A truth that becomes the truth becomes an untruth, becomes a lie. Who believes that Jesus is passionate about prayer? Yep, amen. I also do believe that. But if that's the only thing, that we build our life on, that the only thing God is interested in is us having a good prayer life, then we are pushing away the other things He spoke about. What about justice? What about love? What about the Word of God? What about fellowship? What about community? What about the Great Commission? It's a fragment of truth. And ultimately... When the wind comes, the storms of life come, it won't be enough to hold us. We need to build on the rock. Word of God, it's not supposed to be divided and fragmented. It's a rock. It's supposed to be built on as a whole. I loved watching um, a documentary uh, fairly recently. It was about this uh, lighthouse that was being built off the southern coast of England. And it's an island out there. And I don't know how they managed to build this thing because... The, 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 uh, the rock that they were building upon was basically at sea level and they would have to send out the builders at one point every year and it took them, I don't know how long, but it was a number of years to actually build this thing. And they actually built the lighthouse into the rock. Uh, I believe it was built in the 19th century. 
And how they did it was they, they, they got the foundations of the rock and they got the foundations of the lighthouse and they kind of infused it together. It was a solid foundation. It was a rock solid foundation, a foundation that had been there for thousands of years and not been destroyed. And this lighthouse has experienced and weathered some of the greatest storms of the North Atlantic Ocean. And over its 100 or 150 year history, it has never been broken down. It has never been destroyed. And it's purely because of its foundation, uh, which is rock solid. Now, you see, Peter had a foundation that he wanted to build on. He wanted Jesus to be someone that he wasn't. Peter wanted Jesus to be the military leader. He wanted him to be the political leader. He wanted him to be the one that would be the king over the nation that would drive out the Roman Empire. He wanted to turn Jesus' words that he is a king, that he is the king of kings, and put his own interpretation to it. He wanted to take the rock and turn it into sand. But Peter had to ask himself some tough questions. Am I going to change the Word of God to fit what I believe? Or am I going to let the Word of God come inside of me and change me? The heart that I preach this to you is one that I believe that we are called to be men and women and children that live our life with Jesus Christ as the rock. It's actually for our protection. And that's why I believe that the apostles were so passionate about teaching this as the very first devotion. Build your life on the Word of God. Any parents here? You've got kids? Uh, For Judah, when he was a bit younger, Judah's my three-and-a-half-year-old, when he was about two, he... Uh, was a pretty strange kid because it wasn't the dessert that he went for first. It wasn't the meat that he went for first. It wasn't the mashed potato that he went for first. All he was interested in was the frozen peas. And I have shared this before. It wasn't just frozen peas. It was frozen, frozen peas. And so we would actually have to uh, help Judah to get a well-rounded diet. He had to eat his whole dinner, not just the frozen peas, but he had to eat his mashed potato, then he had to eat his chicken, and then he could eat his frozen peas. And then maybe if he was good, he could have dessert, which coincidentally was frozen peas. It kind of worked in our favor. Um, The point is this. As uh, followers of Jesus Christ, as people following his word, it is essential that we eat the full plate. The entree, the dinner, the green veg, the meat, And of course, the dessert as well. If you look at our world today, top five headlines at the moment. Iraq airstrikes, MH17, Russian sanctions, Gaza, and the Ebola epidemic. Our world has got some major storms that are going on. And the only thing that grounds us is the Word of God. What about the headlines in your life? In your marriage, your relationships, in your work, in your employment, in your finances, in your study, in your health? What are the storms? Or more to the point, where is the foundation? Can I encourage us to be people that build our life upon the Word? The second reason that the apostles were so passionate about this topic, the Word of God, is because the Word of God releases potential. It is seed. And let's bring up our next example. So this is something I'm quite proud of because I grew all of these seeds myself. Uh, my bok choy plants went wild. I didn't get to eat any of them because the snails ate them. But, um, but I did manage to harvest the seed at the end. Now within my hand here are thousands and thousands of little bok choy seeds. And if I am to plant them and look after them, that's the part that I'm not good at. But if I am to plant them and get someone to look after them for me and water them and nourish them and put them into good soil, these will produce, this little container will produce enough green veg to, fill our, uh, to feed our entire church. There is potential inside of the seed. And the Word of God is just like that. How do we know? Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 nine. Who's enjoying turning to your Bibles? That's good. Who's not? Who misses the PowerPoint? Come on, honesty here. Great. Awesome. 
suffer. <laughs> All right, Matthew chapter 13. A farmer went out to sow seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell upon the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell upon the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear." God, or Jesus, specifically explained that the Word of God is like a seed. And when it is planted, not just planted anywhere, but when it's planted into good soil, it will produce a crop. It will produce uh, fruit. What is the soil? Well, I would put to you today that the soil is the condition of our heart. For us to have the Word of God, for us to have the promise of God released in us, we first need to have it in our heart. It needs to be looked after. It is a word that actually, the word for seed there can also be used, or the imagery that can also be used to describe being impregnated to be impregnated with the Word of God, to have the Word of God conceived inside of you and a fruit, a birth, a baby, something to come as a result of that. It is so important. I know when uh, Eudora was pregnant with our kids, she was on the uh, multivitamin, she was eating healthy, she didn't eat her list of 15,000 items that you couldn't eat as preg uh, while pregnant, which meant I got to eat them all. Tough job for a husband. Um, but you had to prepare the body. It had to be at its uh, optimum level of health so that this baby would thrive. So it is with us and the Word of God. To allow the Word of God to come inside of us. What actually is the Word of God though? The Bible that you hold in your hand, the screen that you're looking through, that isn't the Word of God. That's the Bible. But it's not in and of itself the Word of God. The Word of God is when God Himself, the Holy Spirit, comes and breathes upon it. And when He breathes upon it, it comes to life. The Word of God is living and active. Not the Bible. The Bible is not living and active in and of itself. The Word of God. It must be connected back to the source. You see, I've, I've got a Muslim friend who has read from Genesis to Revelation. And he had a good experience reading the Bible but he never encountered the Word of God. To allow the Word of God to come in is to position our heart as we open it. So I would encourage us to make room for the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is not just for the preacher. The Word of God is not for your connect leader. The Word of God is not for your parents. The Word of God is for you and for me today. And I believe that today the Spirit of God is here to breathe fresh revelation, a fresh passion, birth a fresh passion inside of you for His word. But to do so, we actually need to make room in our hearts. One of the analogies, one of the things that Jesus was talking about was when that seed was planted, one of the conditions of the heart was one that had the thorns with it and it kind of smothered, it smothered the word of God. Well, I believe that God actually wants us to get rid of the thorns, the worries, the fears, the stresses, the busyness, the distractions of life and allow the word of God to take full root inside of us. To do so, we must make room. Make room in our day to actually open the Word of God. Make room in our spirit to say, God, illuminate to me the, what, you were, uh, what you were telling me. God, speak to me through the Word today. Can I encourage us this week to be a people that open up the Word of God, make time to read the Word of God, but make space in our heart as well to allow God to breathe revelation to us. All right, the third thing, my second favorite, is that the Word of God is a sword. It is powerful. Nakia, would you like to bear the sword for me? Oh, very well done. I feel like you should bow, but I don't think you'll be able to reach the stage. It's okay, the sword is, is probably blunter than the um, paver at the bottom there. But uh, this is... 
one of my favorite birthday presents of all time. And it represents what the Word of God is supposed to be when it's sharp. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is something that is powerful. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the armor of God and how God, I'm actually having a really good time up here with it, so I'm kind of balancing the whole distraction and with the analogy with the word that I'm trying to bring. But the point that I'm trying to say is this. In Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about the word of God, sharper than double, uh, as a sword of the Spirit, sharper than any double-edged sword. When Paul is talking about the armor of God in that chapter, he talks about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the uh, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. Every single item is defensive in nature. But the Word of God is different. The Word of God is offensive. The Word of God is attacking. The Word of God is designed to be a powerful tool, a powerful weapon in the hand of every believer for us to take ground. It is like, uh, in many ways, it's like a gun. You see, uh, faith comes from hearing and hearing the Word of God, yeah? And without faith, it is, our, our, our works are dead. Faith without works are dead. So when we combine these two together, what we're saying, or what the writer is saying is that faith comes from the word and leads to action. It's kind of like having a gun. The word of God is like that empty gun. Faith is the ammunition and works is the trigger. God actually is calling us to be people that not only know the Word of God, not only believe the Word of God, but actually actively use and are empowered to take a hold of the Word of God, to bring the Word of God into our homes, into our schools, into our friendships, into our finances, into our health, into our connect groups, into our church. The Word of God is supposed to cause us to come to life, to be an aggressive weapon in our hands. Uh, Joshua 24, 15, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It is an aggressive, it is a tool, it is a weapon to take territory. Uh, we read in Isaiah 53, 5 that he was pierced for our transgressions and by his wounds we are healed. It's an aggressive, it's taking territory in the area of our health. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, that no matter what circumstance we face, we can pull out that scripture, the word of God and declare that I may not know what is going on right now, but I know that my God will call, uh, cause all things to work for good because He loves me, because I've been called according to His purpose. Philippians 4, in the confusion, the busyness, the stresses of life, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Word of God is not passive it's not to be left on the shelf. It is not to be left as a sword in its sheath. It's to be taken out. It's to be fought with. It's to take ground. It is a gift for you and for me. In your family, where does the Word of God need to come? Where does the kingdom of God need to be declared? Can I encourage us today to be a people called to action? And if I can ask the worship team to come and join me. Where I want to end today is the very fourth reason. Why were the apostles so passionate about developing a devotion in the hearts of the people for the Word of God? Because the Word of God is all about somebody. It's personal. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. I've read that verse about a thousand times, oh, it's an exaggeration, uh, 15, 20 times, uh, 50 times maybe, and it is one of the most confusing verses in the Bible until you understand what he's actually saying. The writer is saying that Jesus is the Word of God, and the Word of God is Jesus. They're one and the same. See, when we're talking about the Word of God, we're not just talking about a concept or a principle. We're talking about a personal relationship. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Jesus is 
the personification of the Word of God. You know someone because of their words. It's in their communication that you get to know their heart. And that is why God is so passionate about the Word. Uh, Eudora's been reading recently about um, the heavenly man, about Brother Yun in China, and the persecution, the intense persecution, simply because he wanted to, A, have the Word of God more than any other thing in his life. And secondly, because he wanted to share it with the world. He had a revelation that absolutely, the Word of God is a foundation. It is strong, unshakable. He had a revelation that the Word of God was seated. It gave life. It was life transforming. There was such potential in the Word of God. All that he was, all that, uh, that God had for his nation was contained within the Word of God. One word from God can change everything. He had a revelation that the Word of God is powerful. It is a weapon. It's for taking territory, for seeing the kingdom of God advance in the nation that, was, or that, that is China. But he had a revelation that more than anything else, that the Word was God, that the Word itself was Jesus. When we're talking about the Word of God, please, this morning, let's not distance ourselves from Him, but let's instead draw near, listen in, hear, have ears to hear what He has to say. In John 15, it talks about how He is the vine and we are the branches. Remain in me as I remain in you, and let the Word remain in you. Let's be a people that let the Word of God remain inside of us. Let the presence of God remain inside of us. He is one and the same. Why not I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes. And I want to talk to anyone here that does not yet know Jesus Christ. And maybe you have grown up in church your whole life. Maybe you've heard an awful lot from the Bible. Maybe you once had a revelation of the Word of God as the living Word of God. But somewhere along the way, you've forgotten that it's actually all about a relationship with Him. So whether this is the first time and you do not know Jesus Christ and this is the first time you're making a decision like this or whether you have in the past... And today's the day to say, I want to return home. I want to come back into relationship with Him. I want to give you that chance this morning. Who's here that needs to say, Jesus, I commit my life back to you. Jesus, I want to come back close to you. So no one's looking around. Who's here this morning that needs to say, Jesus, that's me. Jesus, that's me. Jesus, that's me. Draw me back. I want to respond to your love. I want to respond to your love. I want to respond to your word this morning. I want to be like Peter, that when you say, follow me, I say, I will. Who's that person here this morning? Okay, I'm going to ask everyone to stand to your feet right now. We're going to come into a time of worship. And just before we do, if you can just raise your hands to heaven, just as a sign of surrender. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come right now and to breathe afresh upon us and to put inside of us a fresh passion for the Word. Some of, some of you inspire me with your passion for the Word of God like nothing else. And yet I'm still going to ask God to breathe more, a deeper hunger. For others of you, it's like there's no desire there at all. And my prayer this morning is that He will come and that He will reveal to you that His Word is Him. And that when you open the Bible and you allow God to speak to you, that it's Him that's breathing life into you, Him that's sowing seed inside of you, Him that's setting a foundation that is going to last the ages and the storms of life, Him that is giving a weapon into your hands, causing you to fight with great authority, with great might, with great power. Father, come right now. Holy Spirit, breathe upon every single one of us here. Father, we ask for a fresh encounter with you, a fresh revelation of the Word of God. Father, we open our hearts. We don't want to read the Word just intellectually. We thank you for teaching, but God, we want more. Father, we want revelation. We want the revelation that Peter had, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We ask that you would reveal yourself to us through your Word. And Father, I pray even right now, 
uh, that all uh, religious ideas coming around the Word of God, all sense of duty and obligation, Father, that would all fall away. Father, we do not have to read your Word. God, we get to. We get to. We get to. We want to. We want to build a love inside of us for your Word, a fresh passion for your Word, a fresh passion for your Word.